Today I want to talk about the contrast, the distinctions that exist between some terminology that often kind of floats around in the Christian community as well as somewhat outside in the rest of the world, the outer world as well, um, that is considered synonymous, interchangeable language, but actually means very different things. And it all involves sin, beginning with um, apologizing for your sin versus confessing your sin versus asking forgiveness for your sin versus repenting of your sin. These are kind of used interchangeably, even though they actually mean very different things in each one of their unique contexts. That, um, and it starts, I think, actually when we're very young, that if you have siblings, you do something to someone that they don't like, hit them, say something mean to them or something like that. Your parents will make you apologize for it, regardless of how you actually feel about it. And so they might make you say the word, I'm sorry, but you don't mean it. It doesn't actually... Um, uh, kind of constitute any sort of confession of guilt. You don't believe that you're actually wrong. You just don't want to get in any further trouble than you already are. And this translates in a lot of ways to the way that we treat um, our interactions regarding sin with God as well. We think that uh, there, we even teach children and we teach others that, well, you just, you got to tell God you're sorry and then move on in your life like just then consider it as forgiven from that point on but it's far more complicated than that and so no it's not enough to just be sorry that something happened especially something in that you yourself are specifically guilty for um it's also not enough to uh admit that something is in fact wrong because we do that all the time. We believe a lot of things are wrong, especially when other people do it to us. But we often tend to feel more justified if we do it than if someone else does it to us. So it's not enough to just admit, yes, something happens to be in the abstract wrong, or that you're sorry that something happened or that you are sorry that you're experiencing the consequences of something. It's more than that. The next thing would be to ask forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness all the time, usually under compulsion, we, that uh, some outside force has told us or compelled us to ask for it, but often we're still in this position of not really, truly being contrite. Not truly believing that what we had done isn't justified. We often consider most of our actions to be justified whether they are moral, immoral, or amoral. But someone forces you You'll ask for forgiveness, whether you want it or not, whether, you, whether even you feel like you need it or not. But as far as what forgiveness is, forgiveness is the wiping away of a debt. Think about uh, when we were talking about debt forgiveness among student loans. The idea that it simply takes the number, however much it was that you owed, taking that number and just dropping it down to zero even though you haven't paid it even though in a technical sense or in a kind of universal sense or a cosmic sense you are still just as indebted as you ever were the person that's holding the ledger simply chooses not to enforce it that's forgiveness if you don't believe or or truly are convinced, say, that what you have done is actually wrong 
and you believe yourself to still be at a zero even though someone else is forcing you to ask for forgiveness, then in a meaningful way, you're asking for something that really doesn't hold any value to you. So, um, the next step is that idea of confessing your sin. If you think about a confession, we've all seen the procedural cop shows and such where they're trying to drive a, uh, or drag a confession out of someone because they believe that they are guilty. That person resisting and not uh, capitulating and such. Confession is a powerful thing. It's um, enough that if a person confesses to a crime, they can actually forego the entire judiciary process, go straight to sentencing, skipping the evidentiary portion, skipping all of the aspects of the trial in which they could defend themselves and going directly to receiving the punishment for whatever it is that they are confessing to. And this goes both horizontal and vertical in that there's confessing your sin to God. Obviously, that bears the weight of you can't falsify. You can't pretend. You can't grandstand as you do so. You're admitting that you are wrong. Someone else, especially in the instance of God, someone else is right. And they deserve compensation for what you have done. Um, in a horizontal way, uh, regarding other people, right? Just just humans. The things that we do to others, the things we say, the things that we have done or neglected to do. Um, confession is a means of healing. James tells us this, that if we confess our sins to one another, that we might be healed by that. And we've always been confused by that and. and for many, many generations in Christianity of, does that mean that if I confess my sin, I can receive a supernatural healing in my body? And what it would appear is, the answer to that question is maybe. See, when you don't confess your sin, a lot of things can happen. One is that bitterness and resentment can come in, worm its way into your heart, and those things do have physical symptoms attached harboring bitterness resentment and unforgiveness um, in as well uh, has the ability to literally rot you from within um, it has actual cardiological neurological mental health consequences but it also has the ability that if you're on the other side like you're harboring unforgiveness that someone else has done something to you and you're harboring unforgiveness toward them about it that that also has cardiological neurological and psychological symptoms that are attached to it because it it eats at you and as well as the way that it just simply destroys your relationships with those people that are directly affected those people that are secondarily affected, like that um, you can no longer associate with certain individuals because they are close with this other person that you're beefing with and such. Like, it has the ability to just ripple outwards and destroy all sorts of things in your life. But if you confess your sins, you have the ability to receive healing for those things. And I wonder how many people are suffering from immense emotional and psychological, neurological um, conditions that it stems from a, an unconfessed sin. It stems from harboring resentment, bitterness, harshness, um, frustration, irritation, uh, animosity towards others that if they were just to get rid of those things their emotional mental and psychological and neurological symptoms 
as well as things like cardiological symptoms would go away with it. I wonder. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but I wonder. We also have the tendency to neglect important habits because of our mental state. Anyone that's just been on vacation, you take two or three days off in a row, go without showering, go without brushing your teeth maybe because you're into a video game marathon, um, just making unhealthy eating choices and such that um, the rest of your body tends to suffer because of the fact that you're just out of your routine. You're just not making as normally consistent choices as you might otherwise be making. Same thing can occur if um, you have unconfessed sin and that unconfessed sin is interfering with your ability to go about certain necessary health routines. Um, especially if the unforgiveness or the sin is towards someone that you live with, your husband, your wife, your children, your parents. So. Um, confession does have the ability to heal. It also has the ability to liberate your spiritual life. That um, sin won't necessarily have a consequence towards you of that God won't hear you. More likely than that, unconfessed sin is going to result in you not being heard. Meaning that you don't pray. You don't worship. You don't read the Bible and so you neglect those spiritual habits out of guilt or shame as you neglect those habits you begin to drift spiritually and before long you are way off course and the first step to getting back on track is that confession and then of course the last part is repentance Repentance from sin is it derives itself from a military term, meaning literally a 180 degree turn. If you are repenting of sin, the direction of sin that you had been traveling in, you take a 180 degree turn and you go the opposite. The Bible uses language of like flee sexual sin, avoid unnecessary temptations, and things of that nature, like run away from those things. That um, repenting of sin means getting away from the sins that you were involved in in the past and you avoid the pathways to retrieve those things. That means if the problem is pornography, not only are you going to avoid, you might have to, let's say, sever some online connections to things. You might have to do away with certain devices that have too ready access to that kind of content. It might mean, mean that you have to delete certain applications because they have too ready access to that sort of content. But it also means that you might have to avoid certain environments because the environment is based on sexual temptation and it could stir up dangerous uh, sinful um, proclivities. It could mean that you have to avoid certain people. It could mean that you have to avoid certain uh, situations or uh, other forms of influence. It might mean that you have to avoid alcohol. It might mean you have to avoid uh, a lot of stuff in order to stay clean. It's like one of the first steps you have to go through when you're in recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous and things of that nature is you need to sever ties that make it easy for you to fall back into your addictive habits. That's what repentance is. Not only I'm not going to do that anymore, I'm also not going to do the things that are adjacent to it either. Psalms uses the language of like, I'm not going to go near the doorway nor approach the road that goes to the immoral woman's house. Like, I'm not even, I'm avoiding it. The way, like, the Jews used to go all the way around Samaria, not even going into the town, the region itself. We're going around it because we don't want to be caught there. 
that kind of a mindset. Now, not being a legalist and trying to foist your limitations onto others necessarily, but if you aren't repenting of sin, then there's no reason to confess it. If you're not going to confess it, then there's nothing to apologize for because you're not actually going to make the meaningful changes. The way they say sometimes that um, if you were sorry, you would change your behavior. It's true. If you're just apologizing, apologizing, apologizing for the same thing over and over again, but you don't change, then um, stop apologizing. You're wasting everyone's time and en energy, oxygen. Just, um, just commit to your behavior. Be honest about it. So, um, this is the reality. If you're not repenting, if you're not turning away from the sin, then you should ask yourself some real honest questions about what is even the point of you confessing it. And if you're going around confessing all sorts of sin, but you want, don't want forgiveness for it, you don't want, uh, or the other person isn't offering you forgiveness, you should really assess some things regarding that. And if you're just going around and apologizing things for things all the time, but you're not changing your behavior, you should really do some internal assessments of why you're apologizing for something if you don't intend to change it. And let that uh, just throughout this year see if that doesn't guide you give you a little bit more insight into who you are as a person